best part of waking up is radiation. In your cup. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we're having a look at two fascinating pieces of mid-20th century ceramics. This is a piece of Fiesta ware, and this is a piece of plant Tuscan china, both manufactured in the mid-1930s. Now, at first glance, these might look like fairly ordinary cups, but if I take this scintillation counter and hold it up, you can see that these are, in fact, mildly radioactive. This is because the glazes on these pieces contain significant amounts of uranium. As I covered in my previous video on uranium glass, link in the description, this is a common practice before the discovery of nuclear fission, meaning many glass and ceramic pieces produced from the 1900s to the 1940s and for many decades afterwards are similarly radioactive. So without further ado, let's have a closer look at these two pieces and explore how and why uranium ended up in so many different consumer products. Now, uranium has been practically used by humans for thousands of years before we recognized it as a distinct chemical element. For example, pieces of Roman glass and ceramic glaze tinted with uranium have been found dating back to the 1st century CE. While starting in the Middle Ages, uranium extracted from the silver mines at Jakimov Bohemia, today in the Czech Republic, was widely used as a coloring agent by the local glass industry. Now, the uranium used in these applications was in the form of uranium oxide, naturally found as a mineral known as uraninite or pitchblende. The latter is an old prospector's term derived from the word pitch, referring to the mineral's greasy black color, and blende, German for to deceive. Traditionally, blends were minerals that looked similar to valuable ores, but were not economical to mine and process. And a common example still in use in geology today is hornblende, which is a family of silicate amphibole minerals. And as luck would have it, I actually have a sample of pitch blend here generously donated by friend of the channel, Ted Nelson. This particular sample was mined in 1975 in the phase shaft of the El Dorado mine, aka Port Radium, on the shores of Great Bear Lake in the Northwest Territories. This mine operated from 1932 to 1982 and, during the Second World War, supplied some 800 tons of uranium ore to the Manhattan Project for use in the first atomic bombs. In 1789, German chemist Martin Klaproth dissolved pitch blend in nitric acid and neutralized the solution with sodium hydroxide, precipitating a bright yellow compound. Assuming this to be the oxide of an as-yet undiscovered metal, Klaproth heated the precipitate with charcoal to yield a black powder he assumed to be the mystery metal. He named this uranium after the planet Uranus, discovered just eight years before by astronomer William Herschel. This planetary naming convention would be continued in the 1940s with the subsequent elements on the periodic table, neptunium and plutonium. However, the black powder produced by Klaproth was probably not metallic uranium, but rather an oxide thereof, likely uranium dioxide or triuranium octoxide, while the yellow precipitate was probably uranium trioxide or sodium diurinate. Indeed, the first product of commercial uranium processing is a bright yellow concentrate known appropriately as yellow cake. And Ted Nelson was also kind enough to send me some yellow cake, this particular sample produced by the El Dorado Mill in Port Hope, Ontario. So thank you so much, Ted. This is a neat thing to add to my collection, though I'm probably on a bunch of watch lists now. Traditionally, pitch blend and other uranium ores were conventionally mined, crushed, then treated with sulfuric and nitric acid to dissolve the various uranium oxides into uranyl sulfate. Sodium carbonate, or soda ash, was then added to bind with and precipitate out any impurities. Finally, an oxidizer and an alkali, typically sodium hydroxide, was added to precipitate out the uranium in the form of bright yellow sodium or ammonium diuranate. Since the 1960s, however, increasing amounts of uranium has been extracted via in situ leaching, wherein these solvents are injected directly into the ground and the uranium extracted from the resulting solution using various methods including resin ion exchange. Indeed, today around 45% of the world's uranium is extracted in this manner. Depending on the specific solvents used, modern yellow cake contains around 70-90% to triuranium octoxide, with the rest being made up of varying amounts of uranyl peroxide, uranyl hydroxide, uranyl sulfate, sodium parauranate, uranyl pentoxide, uranium dioxide, and uranium trioxide. As a result, yellow cake produced by modern processing methods tends to be dark brown, green, or even black, rather than yellow. Still, the name persists out of tradition. Tradition! 
Whatever the case, yellow cake is then shipped to a processing facility where it is further refined into pure uranium oxide and, depending on the application, either converted into uranium hexafluoride to be enriched, that is, have its fissile uranium-235 content increased via gaseous diffusion or centrifuge, or pressed directly into fuel pellets for use in natural uranium reactors like the CANDU. And to learn more about this incredible feat of Canadian engineering, please check out the video I wrote over on Today I Found Out, link in the description. Now, something worth noting here is that while yellow cake is more refined than natural ore, such as pitch blend, it is not more enriched. It still contains 99.28% uranium-238 and thus has the same specific radioactivity as the ore it was refined from. And since U-238 is a low-level alpha emitter, this is fairly safe to handle so long as you don't get it inside your body, either through ingestion or inhalation, where even alpha particles can do quite a bit of damage. Anyway, it wasn't until 1841, 50 years after Klaproth's discovery, that French chemist Eugène Melcois Pelligot isolated the first pure sample of uranium metal. And not until 1896 that another Frenchman, Henri Becquerel, discovered that it was radioactive, famously observing that uranium salts placed on a wrap photographic plate exposed the emulsion in the absence of visible light. Still, it would be another few years before uranium started to be mined in significant quantities, though not, interestingly enough, for the uranium content itself. See, in addition to uranium-238 and 235, pitch blend also contains various products of uranium decay and spontaneous fission, including uranium-234, thorium-234 and 230, protactinium-234, lead-206, technetium-99, actinium-227, promethium-147, and most importantly for our discussion, radium-226, first discovered in 1898 by Marie and Pierre Curie in pitch blend from Jacobov, Bohemia. Radium immediately found all sorts of applications, such as in luminous paints for clocks and watches, cancer treatment, and a wide variety of radioactive quack cures and other dubious consumer products. And to learn more about all that fun stuff, please check out my previous video on tritium beta lights as well as these videos I wrote for Today I Found Out. Links, as always, in the description. The radium boom of the early 20th century led to large quantities of uranium ore being mined in places like Jakimov, Okatanga in the Belgian Congo, and Port Radium in the Northwest Territories. However, as it took three tons of ore to extract a single gram of radium, this industry generated vast quantities of dirt-cheap uranium oxide for use by the glass and ceramic industries. As a result, uranium-tinted glass like depression glass or Vaseline glass, as well as uranium-glazed ceramics, flooded the market. And to learn more about the former, please check out my previous video on the subject, link in the description. And all this finally brings us to Fiestaware, introduced in 1936 by the Homler Lachlan China Company. Founded in 1871 in East Liverpool, Ohio by brothers Homer and Shakespeare Lachlan, in 1902 the company moved to Newell, West Virginia. When Fiestaware was first unveiled at the Pittsburgh China and Glass Show in January 1936, it caused a sensation. Prior to this, most consumer dinnerware was very much stuck in the Victorian era, featuring very florid applique designs. Fiestaware, however, represented a bold departure from the past, featuring bright solid colors and then fashionable Art Deco styling designed by Frederick Reed, a prominent ceramicist in the arts and crafts movement. And while you could, of course, buy complete dinner sets in a single color, from the very beginning, Homer Lachlan sold Fiestaware from open stock, allowing you to mix and match from its entire product line. And this proved an immediate hit, with Fiestaware selling more than 1 million pieces in its first two years on the market. Now, the original Fiestaware line featured 37 unique pieces offered in five different colors, light green, cobalt blue, deep golden yellow, old ivory, and orange red, with a sixth color, turquoise, or robin's egg, being added in 1938. This particular piece is of the orange-red variety and is perhaps the most infamous of the early Fiestaware line due to its high uranium content, around 14% by weight, meaning that the average dinner plate might contain up to 4.5 grams of uranium. However, uranium is also found in lower amounts in other glazed colors, including old ivory. Now, during the same period, uranium also popped up in a variety of other products. For example, as a result of Entente naval blockades during the First World War, the Central Powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, suffered a shortage of molybdenum for high-speed tool steels and were forced to use iron-uranium alloys as a substitute. And starting in the 1920s, uranium was widely used in tiling for bathrooms and kitchens, appearing in red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and other colors of glazes. Indeed, it is estimated around 25% of all houses and apartments constructed in North America between 1920 and 1940 used such tiles, so if you own an old house from this era, it may well contain some uranium glazing. 
Finally, in addition to colored glazes like in Fiestware, uranium was also added to clear glazes on items like porcelain dentures or this plant Tuscan China teacup. This is because many uranium compounds naturally fluoresce under ultraviolet light, as you can see here, meaning the ultraviolet component of natural sunlight will make uranium glazed china glow slightly and appear brighter and whiter than usual. This is the same logic behind adding fluorescent dyes to laundry detergent to make whites appear whiter. And though low-level alpha emitters like uranium-235 are relatively safe outside the body, I don't know about the wisdom of having them embedded in your gums. Anyway, such glazes typically contain around 0.02% uranium by weight along with cerium oxide, which decolors the glaze by converting green iron compounds into clear oxides. Now, this practice continued until around 1986 when the uranium was replaced by rare earth metals such as cerium, terbium, dysprosium, and samarium. Anyway, Plant Tuscan China was manufactured by RH and SL Plant Limited, which was founded in 1898 in Longton, Staffordshire, today part of Stoke-on-Trent, by brothers Richard and Simon Plant. Now, I wasn't able to determine the exact pattern or manufacturing date for this particular piece, but based on the form of the stamp on the bottom, this was likely made after 1936. Now, the Tuscan China plant continued to operate independently until 2014, when it was acquired by the legendary Wedgwood Group and renamed Royal Tuscan. Now, as I mentioned before, this is not intended to be a collector's channel, but if you want to learn more about Royal Tuscan, I'd included a number of collector's resources in the description. And if any of you can figure out exactly what line this piece comes from and when it was manufactured, please let me know. Now, after centuries of being little more than an industrial byproduct or a cheap pigment for making glass and ceramics, in the late 1930s, uranium, of course, acquires significant strategic importance with the discovery of nuclear fission. And indeed, as the Manhattan Project got underway in the early 1940s, the U.S. government seized control of the nation's entire supply of uranium, forcing glass and ceramic makers to forego its use. And indeed, in 1944, Fiestaware retired its orange-red color. While at its peak, the Fiesta Wear line included up to 64 distinct items in six different colors, starting in 1942, Homer Lachlan began retiring a large number of these. By the end of the Second World War, all but the original yellow and turquoise colors had been retired, though in 1950 they were joined by rose, grey, forest green, and chartreuse, returning the total color options to six. Yet despite suffering a significant dip in sales during the war, the company quickly recovered in the post-war boom, its sales peaking in 1948 at more than 10 million 12-piece dinner sets. Now, in 1959, the U.S. government lifted its restrictions on the commercial use of uranium, allowing the orange-red color to be reintroduced. However, it was now produced using depleted uranium rather than natural uranium. Depleted uranium is a byproduct of the uranium enrichment process, in which the uranium-235 content is increased to around 2-3% for use in reactors, and up to 90% for use in atomic bombs. And depleted uranium contains around 0.2% uranium-235, as compared to 0.72% in natural uranium. And to learn more about other uses of this material, please check out the video I wrote on depleted uranium armor-piercing shells over on our own devices. Link, as always, in the description. But while Fiesta Ware enjoyed great success through the 1950s and early 1960s, by the late 1960s, dinnerware trends had started to move away from bright colors and more towards earth tones. So in 1969, Homer Lachlan retired Fiesta Ware entirely and replaced it with Fiesta Ironstone. However, this did not prove popular at all, and it was retired in 1973. This would be the last time that Homer Lachlan would use uranium in its glazes when it reintroduced Fiesta Ware in 1986 at the behest of retailer Bloomingdale's, the orange-red color was completely absent, instead featuring five color options, rose, black, cobalt blue, white, and apricot. This resurrected Fiesta Ware line featured vitreous lead-free glazing as opposed to the original semi-vitreous glazing, making it much safer for everyday dining use. But while this was successful in its own right, Homer Lachlan was starting to face competition from cheaper imports and thus diversified its operations into the commercial food service sector, becoming a major player in that field. In 2020, however, they sold off their food service division to British firm Steelite and rebranded themselves as the Fiesta Tableware Company. Still headquartered in Newell, West Virginia, it continues to sell dinnerware very similar to its original 1936 line, now offered in 39 different color options with a new color being introduced every year. At the same time, vintage Fiesta remains highly sought after, spawning a vibrant collector's market. 
Now, Fiestaware is far from the only brand of dinnerware to use uranium glaze. Dozens of other early and mid-20th century pottery companies, including Caliente, Franciscan Ware, Harlequin, Poppy Trail, Edwin M. Knowles, and Vistosa also used this material. Indeed, it is estimated that between 1959 and 1969, some 2 million pieces of uranium glazed dinnerware were produced worldwide. And even today, small amounts of uranium are still used in yellow orange enamel powder for use in cloisonné jewelry. So at this point, you're probably wondering, is vintage Fiesta ware safe to eat or drink out of? And the answer here is yes, mostly. See, uranium-238 emits 98% of its radiation in the form of alpha particles, with the remaining 2% being in the form of X-rays produced via Bremsstrahlung, which is breaking radiation caused when alpha particles decelerate during collisions with air molecules. Still, the radiation dose rate one centimeter from the surface is only around 0.3 microsieverts per hour, equivalent to an airport body scan. However, as I also mentioned before, alpha emitters are far more dangerous when they are absorbed into the body, and these early Fiesta Ware pieces had semi-vitreous glazes and thus were subject to a great deal of leaching of heavy metals like lead and uranium into the food or drink that they were used with. Indeed, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission conducted experiments in which they washed Fiesta Ware and other uranium glazed dishes with various acids and measured the concentrations of metals that leached out. They found that acetic acid, aka vinegar, can leach out up to 32 milligrams of uranium per liter, while nitric acid can leach out up to 300 milligrams per liter. This means that under normal conditions, a person eating or drinking from Fiesta Ware every single day would absorb around 200 milligrams of uranium every year, equivalent to 400 microsieverts or a single two-view mammogram. So while the Environmental Protection Agency advises you not to eat or drink out of these types of items, you're probably going to be fine. And to learn more about the surprisingly complicated science behind radiation exposure, please check out my video on the subject over on Today I Found Out, link in the description. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and a huge thank you to Ted Nelson for sending me this pitch blend and this yellow cake. These will make fine additions to my growing collection of nuclear-related artifacts. I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more radioactive items and other fascinating devices just like these. Until then, I'm Jim Nessie from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.